just adjust this because I'm a bit taller. Thank you very much um, for the welcome and um, thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of the team. It's been a, a very interesting and exciting year. I've seen a lot of different parts of Finland, met a lot of you, met a lot of students. I've experienced the winter and the summer. Uh, and last night we went and had a lovely dinner on one of the islands called... Yeah. Uh, and uh, when we came back about 10 o'clock, it was still bright sunlight. It was amazing. So um, I'm going to talk... Can you hear me OK? At the back, yes, good. I'm going to talk about what is a Finnish doctor, or more specifically, what is a doctor. Now, I have three daughters, so they're all grown up, but uh, so I'm kind of an expert on Barbie, so I'm looking forward to the Barbie uh, <laughs> exhibition after this. I also know a bit about Cindy as well. I, I sort of trod on rather a lot of them as uh, they were dropped around the house. Uh, but my youngest daughter, Lucy, she works in the Dean Street Clinic in Soho. And uh, it's an NHS HIV and sexual health centre in the centre of London's sort of red light district. It's part of uh, the Westminster and Chelsea NHS Trust. And it is one of the biggest European centres for HIV and sexual health. And Lucy takes histories. She carries out examinations, investigations, she makes diagnoses, she prescribes, she's, she tests and gives bad news to people who have become HIV positive and manages their initial treatment. She carries out screening, other procedures, cauterization, and health education. And she's studying for this diploma in uh, sexual and reproductive health care. So you're probably thinking, why is he telling us about his daughter? Well, the reason is Lucy is a nurse. She's not a doctor. She got a degree in adult nursing four years ago at City University. Now, when I graduated, doctors diagnosed and treated. That was it. That's what a doctor did. But that's not so anymore. In, in the UK, anyway, there are a whole range of clinical specialists who are not doctors, who do a whole uh, range of things that doctors used to do. And that has implications for training and for uh, the numbers of doctors that you need. So in the UK, we sort of reviewed uh, in about 2005 medical training. And John Took was the dean of the Peninsula Medical School in, um, in Exeter and and Cornwall, and then became Vice Provost of University College London, one of the biggest, after Oxford and Cambridge, it's the biggest university in the UK. And he was asked to write a report called Aspiring to Excellence. And he recognised that workforce planning is really hampered by a lack of clarity around doctors' roles. So if you imagine that sexual health clinic and I'm the manager, how many Lucy's do I need and how many junior doctors do I need to train to become consultants in that specialist area? Without those sort of definitions, it's impossible to pr pursue an outcome-focused medical education or attempt to plan the workforce. So John wrote... He tried to sort of clarify what is a doctor. And a doctor's role is a diagnostic person. But one of the things that we do as doctors is handle clinical uncertainty. And to do that, we need this profound educational base in science, evidence-based practice and research. So what doctors do that is different from a nurse practitioner, a nurse practitioner follows protocols and guidelines. If they come to the edge of those, they refer to a doctor. And the doctors have to have the ability to work outside those guidelines if necessary and then justify what they did, if it comes to justifying it. 
Um, the other thing that doctors often are is a, a leader in a healthcare team. And that often means deploying considerable resources and they need management and leadership skills. So this is just a quick overview of medical education in the UK. Uh, four, five and six year undergraduate training. Four year uh, programmes are for graduates. We have a number of graduate programmes where people who have a degree, not necessarily a science degree, it can be a degree in humanities, uh, will come in and do a four year programme. The standard five year programme and then there are some six year programmes which are usually around widening participation. When the students graduate with their medical degrees, every doctor undertakes a two-year foundation programme, which consists usually of six four-month rotations. That's before they go into any specialist training, before they do anything else. So every doctor gets this foundation and one of those rotations is in the community, either in general practice or in psychiatry, of a very broad experience. And then they go on to their general practice or other specialty training. And the regulation of this is covered by the General Medical Council. So the General Medical Council, as I'll explain a bit later, actually allows university to award medical degrees and they can take it away as well. So there are a number of curriculum frameworks and you're probably familiar with a whole lot of them. This is the tuning project, the EU, that we all signed up to uh, and most of us don't carry out. This is the Scottish doctor that some of you are familiar with. Uh, the CanMeds programme, which again is another criteria, but the one I'm going to talk about is the United Kingdom's GMC's Tomorrow Doc tomorrow's doctors. And in 25 years ago, in 1993, the General Medical Council published the first tomorrow's doctors. And I think this is very similar to what we have in Finland now. They recognized that medical schools were actually producing slightly different products. Uh, they had different sorts of assessments. They um, assessed different things at different levels, and there was no agreed core. And Tomorrow's Doctors has been updated and revised over a number of years. Uh, the, the latest version, which is called Outcomes for Graduates, uh, and you can get from the GMC's website, uh, came into effect for all medical schools in the UK from January 2016. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the GMC regulates all stages of a doctor's career. So the undergraduate, the postgraduate training, and then the continuing professional development. So as a doctor, I have a license to practice, and that, uh, in order to keep that license from the GMC, I have to do certain things, like have appraisals, do postgraduate studies, reflection, CPD, portfolios, and after five years, if I've ticked all the boxes, they'll give me another license to practice for five years. So it's quite heavily regulated in the United Kingdom. The training, both undergraduate and postgraduate, is also quite regulated by the GMC. Now, I just wanted to mention health system sciences. So again, when I was uh, a new doctor, there was clinical sciences and basic medical sciences. But over the years, particularly the last 10 years, health system sciences has become more and more prominent, uh, particularly around patient safety, and uh, from the USA. And it takes lots of uh, theories and messages from management, uh, sort of aircraft safety and things like that, about teaching leadership management, teamwork, um, interprofessional working and things like that. And I think we all need to build more of this into our curriculum. And that's a very good book, by the way, that tells you how to do it, <laughs> called Health System Science. So um, the, the GMC in Tomorrow's Doctors breaks down the doctor into th 
three main roles. The doctor is a practitioner, a scholar and scientist, and as a professional. And looks at, in each of these areas, knowledge, skills, and professional behaviours. They don't talk about attitudes, because attitudes are in your head. Behaviours are what you do and what people can <coughs> observe. So you might have bad attitudes in your head, but if your behaviour's all right, that's okay. <coughs> And you can design a curriculum that spirals and builds on these various uh, outcomes. And in our curriculum in Southampton, we have these themes of diversity, ethical law, teamwork, leadership, and patient safety and communication that sort of can be taught in any of the, uh, the various courses. So you could talk about diversity in a surgical attachment or ethics and law in obstetrics and gynaecology, and so on. So by next year, there will be an intake of 8,500 or so uh, medical students into UK medical schools, and there'll be 39 medical schools. The, the government have just created another new, five new medical schools. And... Um, they're all working to the graduate outcomes, the GMC's at graduate outcomes, but they're all very different. Some have uh, an intake of 80, some of 400. Some are problem-based learning, some are systems-based, integrated type uh, uh, learning modules. But they all have the same outcomes. So wherever that doctor works, once they graduate, they should be similar. So we've already heard a little bit about uh, the collaboration of stakeholders, but I think you need to decide what is a finished doctor. And it may be that you can take one of these models, and I mean, like tomorrow's doctors you could take, you could look at it and say, what do we need to add to, to give this a Finnish flavour, or are there things we need to detract that don't apply to Finland? And then from that, you could um, develop a, a shared national core curriculum of, of outcomes, and then work together to show that the outcomes are achieved. So I'm going to move straight on now. Oops. No, the lady up there is going to move me on, I think, to uh, Gerda's presentation. So if, if you go on to the next presentation. So unfortunately, Gerda's mother became very ill, and so she sent her, her uh, talk. Do you need me to do something? No. So if you go on to the next, next one... Next speaker, yeah. I'm having a rapid sex change. <laughs> Five minutes. For this one. Oh, I thought she had ten minutes, but I've overshot. <laughs> it's this one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to give someone else's presentation because you don't quite know what's in their head. But I'm going to do my best. So first I'm going to mention the Bologna Declaration. And uh, some of you will be very familiar with this, others less so. It's a two-cycle system, bachelor's, master's, and it basically allows for transparency of degrees across Europe, or even the world. And you can include it to a three-cycle system with a PhD. It produces these things, and actually, I think, seven out of the eight are provided by a medical program already. The one thing that isn't provided is mobility. It's very hard for students after a couple of years or three years to say, I want to go from Oulu to Helsinki, or from Helsinki to Tampere, or the same in the UK. It's almost impossible. Um, but the 
the cut of having a, a three years bachelor's, then a three years master's allows you to do that. <clears throat> they looked at medicine and the, and the, the um, process, and uh, quite a large number of medical schools and countries said, we don't want to do the Bologna agreement. So 46 said no, 27 said yes, and 27% said maybe. Now Finland, I think, said no, the UK said no, but the Netherlands said yes. The Netherlands is a little country just off the south coast of England. <laughs> that wasn't in the talk. It has, uh, it has eight medical schools, uh, and um, it's a small country and, and basically you get to Amsterdam and you either drive south and you're in Belgium and France or, or the, to the east and you're in Germany. But the, they produced a blueprint for all those eight medical schools uh, to define the sort of the Dutch doctor and they used the CanMeds programme performer which has these sort of competencies, which are kind of fairly standard and similar to all the others. Uh, but they use the CAM meds. And they produced a sort of programme like this. So three years bachelor, three years master, with a research project, with clinical aspects in both. And they also move from sort of lecture-based uh, approach to more uh, problem-based, small group approach. This is across all the eight medical schools. So again, being student-centered, patient-centered, and the teacher acting more of a, as a facilitator. Now, Grunigan, where... Um, Gerda comes from, uh, has a number of hospitals, satellite hospitals, where they place students. And uh, we have a similar, in Southampton, we have uh, 12 or so satellite hospitals where the students spend probably 50 or so, 50% of their clinical time. And they, um, what you have to do is ensure that money follows the students, that the teachers are rewarded supported and trained, and that you quality assure the placements. And it works very well. They also have one in the Caribbean, but I think that was, that's that one down there. <laughs> so um, that summarizes why the Dutch went for this. Uh, in addition, you have to have very good quality insurance, and you have this very much in yours. What you don't have at the moment is this external one. So in the UK, we have the internal process as you do, but we also have every five years or so external visits from the GMC in our case. In, in the Netherlands, it's different uh, well, an evaluation group rather like this from, from different medical schools. And this is the sort of thing that the big evaluation looks at, particularly whether the learning outcomes uh, are aligned and assessed, because that's where things go wrong. They can do this progress testing, and that just shows the how it improves as the years go by. So each one is a different cohort. I must admit, I find the, the progress test slightly difficult because when you're a first-year student, getting 5% or whatever it is must be a bit disheartening, but anyway. And those are the main advantages of the bachelor, master, two-year cycle, two-phase cycle. Transparency, integration, assessment linked with object objectives, and promotion of mobility. And as I, as I say, I think the first three you can do without the BM, the, the bachelor master's break. The mobility is harder. Thank you very much.